Bow your heads, please. Lord, well, thank you so much for this day that you've given us. And I just pray that you please guide us to focus and to learn all the stuff that we need to learn. Thank you so much for Ms. Frady's and how much she blesses us. Just please bless her, Lord. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. So we went over the love languages, and I'm glad to hear that that was applied in some places for you guys. Then the other thing we went over was the personalities. And like I just mentioned, I did my oldest two, but I never did my youngest one. And as we were going through them last week, I was seeing things that have irritated me about my youngest child. And... I actually went home to, and apologized to her because I said, you know, I never taught you the five love languages like I did the older two. My, my youngest child, poor child, she was lucky to get fed. Uh, the older two, you know, I was homeschool mom par excellence, and the youngest went, oh, yeah, can you read yet? No, I'm kidding. But, you, you know, it just happens that way sometime with the youngest. And, and so I never did her personality, and I noticed, remember when we did the uh, personality uh, test and it said doesn't like to be interrupted? Do you remember that one? You maybe didn't even notice it, and it hit me because that particular child is the only one in my family that if you interrupt her, she will not finish. She will not tell you. And you have to understand, everybody in my family talks over everybody else because we're a bunch of otter lions. <laughs> you know, so we're like, ah, la, 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 all the time. So I have this poor child that's got that other personality type that when we're all talking over her, she'll literally just stop. And when I read that last week, I saw that, and I went home and I apologized to her. I said, gosh, I didn't realize that was a uh, personality trait, and we've been killing you all this time. <laughs> so, so she and her fiancé are going to actually be doing the reading that you guys have been doing to figure out their love languages and their personality types. I told you she's marrying a, a golden retriever. And I told him so. I said, you're a golden retriever. And it actually explains some things because he ponders things before he does them. And I'm <laughs> run right in there. Boom. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that didn't work. You know, but that's more of my speed. And, 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 and my, my oldest daughter, she's not the personality type. I told you that last week. And I realized that some of the points of conflict we have are because of this personality differences that we have. And so I need to, instead of thinking, why is she so afraid all the time? She's not afraid. Her personality is different. She doesn't just plow in like I do. She looks at it and goes, why are you doing that? You know, and so it helps even when you're old like I am, that if you understand these personality differences. But what we didn't get to do last week was we didn't get to do learning styles. And believe it or not, those are important. And did you guys read about those? Did you figure out what your learning style was? Okay, good. Most of you did. Um, did I tell you about this at all last week? Okay, because we ran out of time, just making sure. Um, when I had my older two children's learning styles done, my husband and I went to have them done. And so the four of us were there. This is before Kyla was born. And, yeah, the husband, wife, and the two kids went to get the learning styles done. And it was very interesting because my husband is um, a visual. So you could draw my husband a picture of anything, and he gets it. If he sees it, he's got it. It's there. Um, whereas... I'm a kinesthetic, and if you remember from your reading, I basically have to see it, hear it, jump up and down on it, touch it, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm one of those kids that probably would have been on Ritalin if I lived now, you know what I mean, because I'm constantly like this. My mother had three boys and me, and she, would, she was so happy to have a little girl, and she would take me to the store, and I would touch the mannequins in the very expensive stores, and they would fall over. And my poor mother is the most sweet, proper lady in the world, and I'm sure she was just dying inside, but God bless her, she loved me anyway. And now I understand why she would tell me these stories, and I'm like, oh, now I understand why. I'm kinesthetic. I have to touch everything, and I have to be moving, you know, and that's how I learn. Well, when we got tested, this really helped my marriage, because when we got tested, the lady did my husband and says, oh, you're visual, you know, you see things and you get it, and then she goes, but you're kinesthetic. And she started to read off her paper what kinesthetics are like, and she says, you repeat things three different ways before you're done. Now, and this lady, I had taught her children. She was a homeschool mom, and I taught her children. So she goes, that's why you're a good teacher. She goes, because you're so busy explaining it three different ways, most people can get it by the time you're done. Now, listen closely, because this is important. I looked at my husband. For years, we had had a, a, a bone of contention, an issue between us, because he, when I would say something to him, he would say, why do you repeat yourself? Do you think I'm stupid? 
And this was a real problem he and I had because I would repeat myself and say things three different ways and he thought I thought he was stupid. And that was a problem in our marriage. And when that lady, who was a total stranger to the two of us, basically, sat there and said, reading off the paper, you're a kinesthetic and you say things three different ways before you're done. I whipped around and looked at my husband. I go, see, I don't think you're stupid. I'm the one that's got a problem. It's my learning style that I say things three different ways. And that has really helped our marriage because now he'll go, okay, I got it, I got it. You don't have to say it two more times. you know. But now at least he doesn't think that I think he's stupid because I don't think my husband's stupid. I think he's brilliant. I think he's a lot smarter than he realizes he is. Okay, But that made a huge difference in our marriage. So you don't realize, and I know you guys aren't married yet, but it can make a difference in your relationships. If you're a kinesthetic and you hear somebody say back to you, why do you keep telling me that? Do you think I'm dumb? You need to pick it up and go, oh, no, I don't. That's me. I have to say it three times. Just, you know, if you love me, ignore it. Let it go. (laughs) And you can try to stop. It's almost impossible because it's built in. That's how I process. Okay? I'm going to tell you another one, and we didn't go through it. So your learning styles matter. Like my oldest daughter was uh, audio. She was the Awana queen. She could hear a verse and have it, if you don't know what Awana is. I mean, she literally, I could, I... uh, was my first child, so I'm homeschooling with an audio child. So I did the first two years, kindergarten and first grade, on the back of my horse. I just put her on the back of the horse. We'd ride through the woods, and I'd tell her things, and she had it. She learned to do math that way. She learned to do reading that way. She learned everything just listening because she was audio. I'm thinking, oh, this homeschool thing is a breeze. Then came Breeza, and my my sweet Breeza not only has some learning issues, challenges, but she's kinesthetic, which means I couldn't even read to her. Whereas Lena and I were reading all these great novels and da da da, and we're having a blast. Every night I'd be reading, you know, and at lunchtime we would read, before nap time, we just had a ball. Then Breeza was like, she couldn't sit still. She was like mom, and she, she had to touch everything, and she really couldn't listen. And I got to where I carried stuff for her in church so that she could draw and color. Because if she had to sit still, now listen closely, because this is important, because if she had to sit still, she couldn't hear a word the pastor said, because she was too busy thinking, I have to sit still. I have to sit still. I have to sit still. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Whereas if my kid, which she was like me, was drawing or coloring, she could tell me everything the pastor said. I would bring something for her to draw and color and we'd go on the drive home. I'd go, so what'd you get out of the sermon today? And she would tell me and she'd have pictures and things, but she could tell me because she was moving and she couldn't sit still. So for the short time that I worked in the Christian school system, being a homeschool mom, I told the kids, you can color and doodle all you want as long as I can ask you a question and you can tell me what I'm talking about. The kids' grades went up to where the the principal was going, what did you do? I said, I just let them do what their learning style was and they can function better. See, but those kind of things tend to not be taught in college and education departments. These are things, they even when I left, the kids said, can you get another homeschool mom to teach us? Because... We learn it because of our children. So we want to teach you because you're our babies. You know what I'm saying? And so it's different. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's hard for mom because if mom doesn't understand, so like with Breeza, you know how I ended up teaching her Bible stories because she couldn't sit and listen to them? We acted out every Bible story. We acted out every Bible story in the Old Testament. I'll never forget doing Balaam's donkey. And Breeza straddled the dog, and when the donkey, for the donkey, and when the donkey saw the angel, she picked the dog's ears up, like, whoop! And I mean, the whole family just died. But she remembers Balaam's donkey in that story, you know what I'm saying? So we, we literally had to act things out for Breeza to get it. And honestly, I read everything to my Breeza. I want you to understand this because someday you might be homeschooling your children. I read everything to Breeza up through, she could read, but she didn't have any comprehension with her reading. And I would read everything to her up through through high school. When we did world views, I would literally read it paragraph by paragraph and go, do you understand that, honey? No, mom. And I would explain it to her. And she got through. And I just want you to know this. When she got into college, because she knew the Lord called her to be a nurse, and she's my nurse. When she went to college, she finally read her first book. I didn't tell her to. She chose it. And interestingly, she chose uh, Pilgrim's Progress. I think that's the one. And she read it in the Old English. And I looked at her and I go, I can't even read that book. She goes, well, it made it easier for me to concentrate. 
because it was the English was hard, and so she had to concentrate on it. And I want you to know, she graduated. She was an honor student in college because, and and I never realized she was so challenged. Okay, until we I'm speaking at homeschool conferences and I'm listening to Brisa telling people that. She had never read anything complete. I hadn't thought about it. I just kept close to the Lord and kept doing what the Lord told me to do. And, and we got through it. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is because we have to be sensitive to how God has made people. And we have different learning styles. There's something you didn't read about, and that's processing styles. It's actually how our brains process. And I'm going to say this to you because some of you might actually think, oh, I'm not smart, but so-and-so is. My brother's really smart, but I'm not smart. We are all smart in different ways, and we're exactly smart the way God wants us to be smart for his purposes. Some people are hand smart. My second child, my Brisa, she's very hand smart. She could take things apart and put them back together and make my husband freak out because she could literally take things apart and put them back together. She was like our honorary boy because we only had girls, and she could fix anything. And in nursing, it's really good because when equipment goes down, my Brisa can go make equipment work, which freaks everybody there out. Okay, plus she's good with her hands on, with the people. So she's, she you know, worked to do the book stuff, but she didn't do it all the way through high school. It wasn't until she was actually working in what God wanted her to that she was really applying herself hard to do it and she could do it because she was following her call on her life but she's hand smart some people are are number smart are any of you number smart some of you are real good with math and it just it's not too hard for you okay whereas other people go "Oh, oh you're so smart no you're number smart you know we've got the smartness that God wants us to have some of you are word smart you 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 process uh words very well guys my mom always thought I was really smart because I was really good at math. And I was considered gifted in the public school because I was really good at science and math. But my mother, as an adult, would spell words to me that she didn't want my children to hear. And I'd go, wait, wait, wait. And I have to see the word in my mind. I cannot just hear letters and spell. And my mother would freak out. And she'd go, I can't believe you know, you're so smart. And you've got that college education. And you can't. I go, no, my brain doesn't process that way. And so she quit spelling to me. Because literally, it was slower. The kids could figure it out before I did. Because I'd be putting the letters together and seeing it in my mind before I could get it. Now, does that mean I'm dumb? No. By that time, I already have my degree in place. And I just know my brain doesn't work like everybody else's. And that's OK. My brain works exactly the way God wants my brain to work. Your brain works exactly the way God wants your brain to work for his kingdom purposes. It's not about you and it's not about me, is it? It's about his kingdom work. And you are exactly, perfectly what he wants you to be for his kingdom work. Now, is that an excuse to say, okay, so I'm not going to do math because I'm not good at it? No, that's no excuse because God wants us to learn perseverance, doesn't he? He wants us to press through and have self-control and to do the best we can. And I'm going to tell you right now, math, I really believe with all my heart that math is for us to learn a work ethic. I believe God means for people, to uh, Christians, to learn a work ethic through math because math is work, isn't it? Even if you're good at it, and like it. It is work. So don't go, oh, I'm just bad at math. You should be doing about two hours of math a day. And if you're not, you're not bad at math. You're not doing enough. It's not like everything else. You don't learn it like everything else. And I'm saying that as someone that was gifted at math. And I did an hour at school and I did at least an hour at home every day. And when my kids would go, well, mom, you were good at math. I'd look at them and go, honey, if you spent two hours a day on math, you'd be brilliant too. I mean, seriously, be honest. How much time are you spending on math? Don't say it out loud. But are you spending two hours a day? Good girl. Okay. A lot of you aren't, though. And that means really applied time, not, oh, mom's over here going, would you please get your math finished? You know, no, I'm talking about actual applied time, okay? So the point is that our learning styles do matter, and we need to apply ourselves, and our processing styles matter. Now, I'm going to apply this one more time on a relational basis, <laughs> and I hope I don't get in trouble for this. <laughs> I'm uh, the the... Processing styles are abstract versus concrete. And that's somebody that if you said, uh, if the step says step down, they're going like this. Like, why isn't it doing it? You know, because <laughs> they're very concrete. Whereas an abstract person gets like a different kind of picture. Okay? And abstract people tend to be better at upper math. I'm going to tell you that right now. Uh, because they can get the abstract con concepts a little better, whereas a concrete person, you know, if it says, uh, um, 
Oh, there's signs that have, uh, concrete people have trouble with because they're, they're so concrete in their processing that they want it to be exactly like the sign says, and, and it confuses them. Shame on me. I didn't read this recently, so I can't give you an example. If I come up with one, I will. And then there's, and there's random or sequential. Now, sequential means that Sequential means that you put everything in like lists, you know, one right after the other. That's what sequential means. And random means like my bedroom, okay? Wow. Okay? So if I remember correctly, I'm abstract sequential. And this is why I'm good at math. I can do upper level math. And this is why I'm reasonable at teaching because I, or speaking, I'm a speaker, because I put things in an orderly fashion usually so that people can follow it when I have time, you know, <laughs> to work on that. My daughter is concrete. And I can't remember. I think she's concrete sequential, my oldest one. And that's part of the reason we have trouble communicating sometimes because she doesn't understand. She says, you're so much smarter than I am. I go, no, I'm not. My brain is like out in space somewhere and you're back here on Earth, you know. And that's, that, it's just the difference in processing styles. But I'm going to bring you home to where this really got to me. When I learned this, and I learned this at a teacher's conference I went to, um, <laughs> I went home and... My mom told me a story of something that happened, and then my dad told me a story that something that happened. And for the first time, I realized my dad wasn't a liar. All my life, I just thought my dad was a liar because he would tell me things, and they were so different than what really happened. I think, oh my gosh, he just is a liar. And then I learned about this. And my mom told me a story, and my dad separately told me the same story. And for the first time, I realized my dad actually sees it that much differently. His processing style is so different that he wasn't lying. He actually perceives things very differently than the rest of us, which makes life very interesting with my father. Okay? But at least I know now he's just not lying all the time. Now, I'm saying that very openly to you, and, and I may even get in trouble doing this online, but I'm going to keep that in because I don't want you guys to have that same problem. For years, I thought my dad was lying to me, and he wasn't. He processes differently. My dad is the most abstract, random person. My husband, it frustrates my husband to death because he'll say things. My, my husband looks at me and goes, there's no logic there at all. <laughs> you know, it's just like, woo, out there and random and all over the place, you know, and it's very hard to track with my father. Frequently when my dad says stuff, my husband and I will look at each other after and go, did you get that? And we'll try to piece it together the best we can, you know, because... Neither my husband nor I are this, and yet that's what my dad is. Now, I'm saying that to you. Can you think of somebody in your life that you think fibs a lot? That person might actually be perceiving things differently than you. Now, they might be a pathological liar. I'm not saying they're not. But there's a chance that they actually perceive things differently than you, and therefore, do you know somebody that has said something to you before and you thought, wow, I didn't look at it that way at all? Have you? Okay. Those are processing styles and their differences. And once again, our processing style is exactly what we need to serve God's purposes because each of us in the body of Christ have very different purposes, don't we? Okay? All right. So that was wrapping up last week. And I know uh, that, that wasn't even in your reading, but it was, it was tied in with that, wasn't it? Okay. So there's personality styles. There's learning styles, there's love languages, and there's processing styles. Wow, we don't want to label people. We don't want to bag people and go, you're one of those. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to do that. I already told you my love languages and my personality styles have changed over the years, my, more my personality styles, because as I pray to become more like Christ and love people like Jesus loves people, I notice that God is changing my personality because I'm not allowed to be so uh, in your face and then you know have to go back and say, man, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to act that way. And you don't know how many people I've gone back and apologized to since I've tried to get right with the Lord. Okay. It's not fun to open your mouth and remove both your feet. All right. So, you know, try not to do that. Try to pray before you talk. So let's do today's. Uh, were any of you under conviction when you did this week's reading? I was. Maybe you're too young to be under conviction about this yet. Boy, I was. Uh, so we're learning about the five steps of communication for conflict resolution. And once again, even though this was written for husbands and wives, that's because husbands and wives have the most conflict, I think. But it definitely applies to other people in your life because I could see uh, some of this being helpful for conflict resolution between me and my children, uh, between me and my parents, be between me and other people. So hopefully it'll work for you too. And remember, it was love and it was spelled... L-U-V-E, 
And then they added an A on the end, didn't they? Do you remember that? What does L stand for with conflict resolution? Yes. Listening. Very good. Thank you, Kiri. Listening. And what did you learn about listening? How does listening look? How does listening look? Yes. Like turning off your TV and your phone and looking at the person and checking out their hand movements. Did, did you hear what she said? Thank you. So that means not being distracted. Don't be looking at your phone. Don't be looking at the TV. Look at the person. It said to actually turn towards the person. It said to don't be doing something with your hands, but to actually... Now, this is very hard for mothers because oh, it's very hard. She could be cooking or something, and somebody wants to come up and talk to her, and she can't exactly just turn the food off, you know, or whatever. So this can be very difficult, but you've got to try the best you can. Uh, I'm going to tell you this right now, and it's not conflict resolution, but I heard my kids once again say this to me after they were grown. I heard Dr. James Dobson of Focus on the Family. God bless his soul. If any, that he blessed my family more than I can ever tell you. And if you don't know who he is, your parents probably do. Um, he's, he's an elder gentleman now. He's older than I am. He was a grown-up when I was just married. Okay, get it from there. But James Dobson said, when your children bring something to you and your children are excited about it, stop whatever you're doing and be excited with them. So when my kids would bring up a pine cone, mom, look at this pine cone. I would stop what I was doing because I trusted James Dobson, good Christian man. And I would look at it and go, wow, what a cool pine cone. Or look at this bug. Wow, what a cool bug. Look at the colors on that thing. Oh no, my kids liked bugs, especially colorful bugs. And so I made a point of doing that because I trusted good old Dr. James Dobson. I want you to know that when my kids became adults, my kids, the two older ones, actually came back to me and said, Mom, thank you so much for always being excited about what we were excited about. And I said, oh, thank you, God, for James Dobson. You know, because he's where I got that. I didn't know to do that. So I want you to be aware of that it's a constant learning process. They're constantly trying to be a better person uh, within the body of Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and be teachable. Have a teachable spirit. But guys, when somebody comes up to you, does your little brother or little sister do this now? And you kind of go, uh-huh, uh-huh, go away. Yes. Uh-huh, yeah, see? Mm-hmm. I'm saying if you would stop and listen to them, this is what we're talking about here, if you would stop and listen to them for a minute and show some kind of enthusiasm about what they're excited about, and that's the point. If they're excited, you need to be excited with them. Wouldn't you want them to do that for you? If you were excited about something, don't you want whoever you're showing it to to be excited also? Sure you do. And doesn't Jesus tell us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us? Right? Okay. <clears throat> so that means stop and be excited. Wow! I've only got two seconds because I'm doing my math, but wow! You know, you can stop for a minute and show them some enthusiasm, right? They're going to love you for it because that, that shows them love. Because you're showing them that you care about what they care about. And listening to somebody shows them that you care about what they're saying to you. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, as moms, we have a hard time with that. Don't we, moms? It's hard. How many times do you remember when, you remember when your mom actually stopped, put everything down that she was doing, turned and looked at you and listened? It, it makes an impression when she does do that, doesn't it? Okay, so we can listen. That means if your best friend and you are having a problem... You need to practice this. Once again, I'm looking at the girls. You guys aren't as weird about this. Us girls, we kill each other when we have a best friend that's done something we're mad about. Okay? We're worse than husbands and wives. It's terrible what we do with our girlfriends. You guys are laughing because you know it's true. And so, and you guys, just be glad you're guys. So girls, when you have a problem with your best friend, the first thing we need to do is stop and listen to them. Actually, uh, oh, and did you get with the listening that it didn't mean to, I was so convicted, that it doesn't mean to say what you think. It means to shut up and listen whether you agree with them or not. Oh, 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 I was so convicted. And so on page 64 of your reading, it says turn towards the person and give them eye contact. Offer your undivided attention, uh, putting what you're doing out of sight and out of mind. Oh, that's so hard. Do you guys ever, I have to, when I get in church, I have to actually ask the Lord, will you please help me focus now, Lord, because I'm really having trouble getting my brain here. It's still back doing something else. 
you ever have that issue? Yeah, me too. And I just want you to know, do you know how I've fixed my little kinesthetic problem with listening? I have a journal that I take to church, and my journal goes to church with me with my Bible. And everything the pastor says, I am taking notes the entire time. And I have people look at me funny because I take notes everywhere I go, no matter where I go, even a, a church that I'm visiting. I am writing down what the pastor says. You know why? Because if I don't, I won't hear a word he says. Because I'm still kinesthetic. I'm still that little kid, okay, that has trouble listening. But I learned a long time ago that if I take notes, I can hear what they say because I'm busy writing it down. I'm active. I'm doing it. And my daughter, she takes notes in, in church too. The one that's like me, she has a journal and takes notes in church too. So that's how we've learned to listen better. Okay, so I just want you to know that. Um, concentrate on what he or she is saying and pay attention to his or her heart, feelings, and emotions. In other words, even if you're mad about what happened, my girlfriend did this or that to me, or, or my brother did this or that to me, you may want to actually try to connect with what, what was going on in their heart that caused them to do that. That's what that's talking about with that part of listening. Watch nonverbal cues and body language. Um, and that's important. If you see somebody like this, does that say something good? No. And I'm going to tell you as a Christian to look past the anger to the hurt. When people are hurt, they are the nastiest. Have you guys noticed that yet? Oh, especially a woman. I can't speak for you men. But us women, if you hurt us, oh, we get vicious. Oh, it's not good. It's not Christ-like, but it happens. Okay, and so look past the anger, look past it and try to see what happened, what the person is feeling. That's what it's talking about here. Um, use encouraging and reassuring gestures and body language. Maybe put your hands on the person while you're listening. Um, if it's somebody you can, like a little brother or sister, hold their hand while you're listening so that you're actually they connected, okay? I have a little brother, so I can relate to wanting to kill them, and I can relate to wanting to love them too, okay? And so, no, I'm serious. I'm very, very serious. I'm ashamed, but we're very close now. But there were times that I probably almost physically did almost kill him. Um, uh, but, you know, I repented and, and learned to be buddies with him, and he remembers the day I offered him the peace treaty, and told him, if you will act this way, I'll let you hang around me and my friends. And that was when we started to work it out. So um, he's five years younger is why, you know. So don't get sidetracked by whether you agree with what they're saying. And that's really hard for me. Are you like that? If you don't agree with what they're saying, you want to go, but, 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 but. Oh, I'm glad I'm not the only person like that. I saw a couple of you that responded. That's good. I'm not alone. So those of us like this, we need to go. Bite your tongue or something. Uh, just don't let yourself talk. Say, Lord, help me. Help me to keep my mouth shut. Help me to see their feelings. Help me to listen. Be praying, guys. Um, don't get sidetracked on whether you agree or disagree and let him or her finish talking before you respond. Oh, that's a hard one. I already told you, everybody in my family, all over each other. So we got to a point where we started to pass around a rag, and whoever had the rag was allowed to talk. I know that sounds funny, but it worked. Nobody else was allowed to talk if you didn't have the rag. So when that person got done, then they'd pass the rag, and then the next person could talk. And you could use almost anything, couldn't you? A spoon, whatever. The the idea was for everybody else to shut up while you were trying to finish what you were saying. Have you ever noticed that some people talk slowly? People that talk slowly in my house are, are dead. Just, you know, because if you like breathe in between, the next person starts. You know, and so this is saying, don't do that. Keep your mouth shut. Sit there very patiently. Oh my goodness, we have to pray for patience to do this, don't we? We have to be patient because we have to sit there and wait and go, are you finished? Right? I mean, that's hard. You guys all know me now. You know that's hard for me. So this is taking some effort. And then it says, uh, what about when your buttons are pushed? Oh, you have to be careful and keep really be asking the Lord, oh, please, Lord, be my Jehovah Shalom and give me peace so that I can keep my mouth shut and hear this and really do the right thing. Now, what did you stand for? Because we've listened now. We've talked about listening. What did you stand for? Yes. Uh -oh, understanding. Very good. Understanding. And how hard is it to understand what somebody else is saying if you disagree with it? Can be hard, huh? So once again, while we're keeping our mouth shut, we can be praying and asking God, please, Lord, help me to understand how that person feels so that whether I agree with them or not, I can at least understand better what they're talking about. God can do that for you. 
because it honors God when we are trying to get past ourselves and trying to make peace with someone else so that we can honor him in it. And so that's a good thing, and God will answer that prayer. So he'll help us to understand. And it's very important for us to understand whether we agree with the person or not, because otherwise we won't be able to understand their heart. And frequently when people act the worst, once again, is when they've been hurt. And so we have to understand that they're hurt. Do we have to agree with why they're hurt? No. We don't have to agree with why they're hurt. We just have to understand that they're hurt, and maybe it'd be nice if we understood why they were hurt, whether we would be hurt by that or not, um, or why they were frustrated, or why they were, oh, I was so convicted by all this reading this week. I'm going to tell you this right now. So, okay, what's the V stand for? Come on, somebody else. Validation. Very good. Thanks, Joe. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a kind of a word. It's like when we did the personality test where I kept looking at you going, what do they mean by that? Validation, it actually tells us here, is an opportunity to communicate... um, an opportunity to communicate that your whoever you're talking to, this person, your spouse, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, their heart and emotions are important to you. And if you invalidate, the opposite of it is to reject them, debate with them, minimize, demean, or judge them. Oh my goodness, was I convicted. Now I know you're thinking, I'm not judgmental. <laughs> well, I am. And the more I pray and the closer I get to the Lord, the Lord shows me how judgmental I really am because he'll, I, I can hear the Holy Spirit go, did you hear what you just said? And I'm like, oh, what I just said about that person. Oh, God, forgive me. You've forgiven me. I'm not to be judgmental about others. It's really easy, especially the people close to us, to be judgmental about them, isn't it? And reject them. Oh, come on. We've all rejected somebody close to us at some point in time. Even if, even if it's just by picking up the phone while they're talking to us. That's mega rejection. How do you feel when somebody picks up the phone when you're talking to them? Don't you feel rejected? Yeah, you do. Be honest. So we've got to be careful to not make people feel rejected. Debate with them. Oh, my heart be still. I've got to shut my mouth. Right? Don't debate. Don't say, well, wait a minute. If you did it this way or have you thought about this? (sighs) He even admitted he does it. He says he's always trying to fix his wife, fix the problem. That's me. I've actually heard my daughter say to me, Mom, can you just listen to me and understand my feelings? Is that what we read this week or what? I mean, oh my goodness. So I was very, very convicted. So to validate that means whether you agree with what they're experiencing or not, you're saying, I care about your heart. I hear what you're saying. Uh, you felt frustrated or, or you felt hurt because of this or that. And you could say, I didn't mean to make you feel that way, but they need to hear that you understand that they feel that way and that it matters to you. That's, I think, what validation is. So look at the list on page 67. Who wants to read the first one? I want you guys to read these to me out loud. So get page 67 out because you're going to participate. Okay? All right, who's going to read the first one? Yes, ma'am. You're so sensitive. Okay, have you ever said that to somebody? Okay, I got a lot of smiles. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I've said that before. I was so convicted by these. Who wants to do the next one? Come on, somebody else. Yes, sir. That's ridiculous. You shouldn't feel that way. Oh, my goodness. I have said this. I think I've said all of these recently. It's terrible. What's another one? No, somebody else. Come on. Let's have you. Joe? It's no big deal why you get so emotional. Oh, boy. Especially you guys probably have said that to your sisters or female friends before. And, guys, that, these are plays, ways to invalidate somebody. And I've, been, I've, been, I've said these things to other people, like I said, so I think I've done all of these. Uh, who wants to read the next one? Micah, you want to read one for me? Okay. No, you're overreacting. Thank you. Okay, lighten up. You're overreacting. I say that to my husband a lot. I'm ashamed, but I do. I was so convicted by these. Uh, you want to do one, Nick? Go ahead. Yeah, people say that one to me a lot. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, who wants to do the next one? Yes, sir. Relax. Stop freaking out. Yeah, once again, I say that one a lot to people around me in my family. That's not good. I mean, I, I, some of these I've said repeatedly recently. Thank you, sir. What's another one? One of you girls. Come on, let's get a girl involved. There's a girl. Go ahead. You're so 
Thank you. You're not being rational. What I would say more logically would be you're not being logical. But to me, that's my version of that, right? Yeah, that's not good. People don't always feel like being rational, right? So pfft, we can't always do that. Okay, who wants to read the next one? Grace, you want to read one? Sure. Uh, it's something to get upset over. You shouldn't let it bother you. Yep, yep. I've said that one way too many times. Come on, haven't you guys said any of these? Yeah. I mean, I was so convicted. Give somebody, give me the last one. Yes, ma'am. You should be over that by now. Thank you. Oh, aren't you, aren't you over that? Why are you bringing that up again? <sighs> and he says right here, these are ways to invalidate a person. Uh oh, I'm a huge invalidator. I, I really had to repent before the Lord on this, and. I haven't said I'm sorry to my husband yet, but I'm going to have to <laughs> because I said all these things to him very recently. Now, it said something called gaslighting, and this was real interesting to me. Did you guys catch that? I didn't ask you a question about it, but it said gaslighting was making the other person either feel like there's something wrong with them or they're crazy. Have you ever felt, because of the way somebody was treating you, that maybe something was wrong with you? Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. When I read that, I remember the first year I was married, my husband had me convinced I was crazy. I was totally convinced from the things he told me that I was crazy. And then I went to hang out with a girlfriend of mine who is, was in vet school at the time. She's very intelligent. She is now a vet and an attorney. Okay, so I have a lot of respect for my girlfriend uh, intellectually. I went and hung out with her. And when I'm talking to her, I realized all the things my husband had me convinced I was crazy on, I was just a girl. And he was raised with his brothers, his sisters were so much older they were out of the house by the time he was a teenager and would have interacted with girls. So he had no clue how girls actually were. Dating them never got it for him. Living with one really drove it home. And honestly, I was raised with all brothers, so I'm less girly than a lot of girls. But I was still a girl. And when I hung out with my girlfriend, Cindy, I went home to see my husband and I said, you had me convinced I was crazy. I remember saying these exact words to him. You had me convinced I was crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm just a girl. And if you don't like guys, you better get over some of this stuff because I'm just a girl. And he just looked at me like, where did that come from? But things started to shift at that point because he stopped trying to tell me I was crazy when I felt certain ways because I would look at him and go, no, I'm not crazy. I'm a girl. And we think differently. And the reading you did told you that, didn't it? That, that we see things, it was the second part of the reading, but we see things through pink glasses and guys see things through blue glasses. And when you put them together, you get royal purple, which is the way God wants things to be. God gives us the picture that it actually takes both the male and female perspective to give you God's perspective. And so that's why marriage is actually a picture of God. It's a picture of Christ in the church. It's a picture of God in Israel, isn't it? Okay, because it actually takes both perspectives. But we truly do see things differently. We process things differently. When you take my biology class, I'll explain to you part of the reasons that we do that. There's actual physical reasons that we think so differently. We're actually wired differently. When they say we're wired differently, they're not just kidding. The two halves of our brain are wired differently. We have more connections. You guys have less. And there's very good reasons for that. No, no. And, and it's because girls are much easier to distract because we've got like... If you want to do it with a computer, girls have about eight to ten screens up all the time. Right? We're multitasking. And the guys have one screen up. Right? One screen. And, and have you ever heard your father say to your mother, can't you just focus on one thing at a time? You ever heard that one? Okay. This is what you're talking about. Women, our brains are actually wired differently. We have more connection between the two halves of the brain and the men have less. And when I found that out, and I actually, in biology, will explain to you what happens and why that happens. But I asked God as a Christian, I said, okay, Lord, I know that women aren't superior to men. Uh, so why did you do that? And the Holy Spirit answered my question. He took me back to, what do you know is true? Well, God made men to be protectors and providers and initiators, and he made women to be um, keepers of the home, responders, and, you know, to help meets. And so women have to be able to multitask. That's why we have to have more connections between two halves of their brain. Otherwise, uh, when the baby's screaming and you're cooking something and somebody rings the doorbell, y everybody would die, okay? Uh, but... The same is true for a man. If a man can't focus on one thing and not be distracted, how is he going to protect his family? How is he going to not get killed when he's out providing and it might be something dangerous? Does that make sense? So we're actually wired just right for our God-given purposes, once again, right? But 
That doesn't mean it makes it easy to communicate. So we have to remember that when we're trying to communicate with each other. And instead of just going, are you crazy? Or making each other feel crazy. We need to not gaslight people. We need to not make them feel this way. And if somebody makes you feel this way, you need to not allow yourself to feel like you're going crazy or something's wrong with you. You need to really get before the Lord and try to figure it out. Okay? And prayerfully try to figure it out. Yes? Um, one of my guy friends told me that um, guys can think about nothing. Oh, yeah. I learned that from a Christian comedian. That guys can actually think about nothing. Now, you guys think that is not, what's, what's the big deal? Women. I, there's a Christian comedian that was on with Tim Hawkins, and it was so funny. Because he goes, my wife goes, what you thinking? And the guy goes, nothing. No, come on, what you thinking? And he goes, nothing, a big zero. There's nothing going on in my mind. And he goes, she doesn't understand that. And the guy, he's so, so funny. He goes, She's like a mega computer calculating all the time. These things are going through her mind. He goes, I'm like a little solar calculator. You get on a pack of cigarettes, you know. <laughs> it's just, and, and what he's saying is, guys, and he goes on, and it's hysterical to listen to him. But as married people, I said to my husband, is that true? He goes, oh, yeah, I can think about nothing. He goes, and I know you can't, and I can't. On Sabbath, I literally have to ask God to help me not work. Because even if I'm physically not working, my brain is working. And I have to make myself stop thinking about anything except for the Bible, the things of God, praise and worship, resting. I have a difficulty. If for me, Sabbath is a verb. Okay? I have to Sabbath. Because resting is an action word for me. I have to actually think about resting. It's hard. Do you see what I'm saying? So... It is true. That's so funny that Gianna would say, uh, Gianni would say, uh, Julia would say that. I'm going to get it. That Julia would say that because that guy does a whole thing on that, that guys can think of nothing. And you guys are up here giggling because you're like, yeah, so? Women can't do that. We don't know how to do it. It doesn't shut down very easily. Even when we're asleep, we're busy dreaming. It's going all the time, you know? And so it is. It's very difficult. And it's hard for guys to understand that. So, ladies, that means don't look at your friend that's a guy or your brother or your husband when you get married and go, what you thinking? Because he might really not be thinking about anything. And then you're going to think he's lying to you. Because for us, if, I'm going to tell you something now, fellas. If your lady says, what, if you say what you're thinking and she says nothing... That's not true. <laughs> okay? Just, she just don't want to tell you, that's all. All right. Um, so we are to validate one another by allowing other people to share their feelings and to let them know it's okay to share their feelings, whether we agree with them or not. Okay. It says on page 68, there's a couple, three powerful things we can do to validate each other. First off, repeat back what the other person says to you. So let's say you've had a big fight with your best friend, your girlfriend, and, and I'm talking to the girls here. And, uh, you know, she says, well, I was hurt when you invited so-and-so over and didn't invite me. Now, whether you agree with it or not, you need to say back, so it really hurt your feelings when I did X or Y. That's repeating back. This is very helpful when you've got a male-female issue going on, though, because once again, the guy's perceiving it this way. She's perceiving it over here. And if you say it back to him frequently, I've noticed my husband goes, no, that's not what I said at all. I go, wait a sec, that's exactly what you said. No, 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 that's not what I said. And then he'll repeat it and trying it in a different way so that maybe I can understand it. So it really is important to repeat things back to people. I've even had that happen with one of my daughters, where if I repeat it back, she'll go, that's not what I said, Mom. And I'm like, okay, then that's what I heard. So say it for me a different way and, and, and let me try to get it. So repeating things back is very, very helpful. Uh, acknowledge the underlying emotion. Say, look, whether I agree with you or not, whether I did something wrong or not, I acknowledge that what I did hurt your feelings, and I never meant to hurt your feelings. Does that make sense? You know, it could have been a total accident. You could think the person is being totally bizarre, but you're still going to acknowledge their feelings and say, wow, I never meant to hurt your feelings, and I'm really sorry that I hurt your feelings. And then it says the third thing is accept um, their feelings and perspective. Uh, once again, whether you agree with it or not, it says, I would feel the same way. I can understand you feeling that way. What you say matters to me. Your feelings matter to me. That's a big one, guys. If you can say your feelings really matter to me, including to your little brother or sister who maybe you need to care more about what their feelings are, okay? Because, uh, you know, they're going to be an adult someday. They're not going to stay irritating little children, 
Okay? And so I know some of you, I had a little brother. I know how it is. You know, he'd get in my room and I'm like, I'm going to kill you. Anyway, yeah, I told you I had all brothers, so I, 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 had, to, I had to be tough. It just was no choice. Um, what does E stand for? So we got listening. Listening, right? Okay, we got, <laughs> make it an actual word. We've got understanding. We've got validating. What's the E for? Come on. What's the E for? Empathy. Empathy. How many of you have ever heard that word before you read this? Oh, like a few of you. Okay. A few of you. That means you're actually trying to feel what the other person feels. Empathy means you're putting yourself into the other person's shoes and really trying to feel it. That is a really good technique. And it, it went through how Jesus used empathy because he wept. When uh, Lazarus died, he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. Didn't it ever kind of bother you that he knew he was going to raise Lazarus, but he cried anyway? Jesus was empathizing with the, Mary and Martha and the people that had lost their loved one. So obviously, Jesus would have us to empathize. On page 71, it says, First allow your heart to be touched by the other person's pain. Then allow your heart to experience what that person is feeling. And finally... Um, don't try to end their pain. Now, that's a big one for me because I'm bad about it. If I see somebody hurting, I want them to not hurt anymore. I'm a fixer. Ah, oh, curious too. Okay, we're, I am too. And I want to fix it. I want to make it go away. And apparently we're not supposed to do that. And I've actually had my daughter say to me, Mom, don't try to fix it. Just feel it with me or let me feel it and, and love me. And so, obviously, that's a personality problem that i got to get over. And so don't always try to fix things. Let people go ahead and feel it. Do, do any of you know what sitting shiva is for a Jewish person? When somebody dies in a Jewish family, what they do is they cover all the mirrors in the person's home, and they sit shiva. And I think I'm saying that correctly. I hope so. And so, the, let's say the spouse of the lady, the, lady, the, the husband died, She'll s sit in her home, and her friends will come over, and they will sit with her. They will not talk to her. If she doesn't start talking, they don't ask her questions. They don't try to talk to her. They sit shiva, and that means they just physically are present with her, and they'll take turns so that somebody is with her anytime she's sitting there, and there's no mirrors to see because she doesn't need to see how bad she looks because she's in mourning, and she looks badly because she's been crying, and it's called sitting shiva, and, and I've heard that it really does help people that are going through a mourning process because they just want somebody there, but they don't want to talk, and they can't make the feelings go away, so it's just helpful for them to be there, and I've heard Christians that have learned this from the Jewish community say that we should probably sit shiva with one another. Just be there for somebody that has lost a loved one or is in pain, divorced or whatever. And just, uh, and I know, shame on me, I'm immediately thinking of somebody your age that has lost a dog or a horse or a cat that they really loved. You could just go over and not try to fix it, but just allow them to hurt and just be there for them. Obviously, people lose real people too, but I mean, it matters. If you've had a dog all your life, because you guys are like 15, you could have a dog for 15 years, couldn't you? And then your dog dies? Oh my goodness, you lost a member of your family, don't you? And so, it, you know, we need to feel for one another. Now, some of you are looking at me like I'm nuts because you're not animal people, but animal people understand what I'm saying there. Okay, so empathy. Um, and then, it, it had an A on the end. What was the A for? Apologize. Very good to, to apologize. And it tells us how to apologize correctly. Turn over to page 72. He says there's four parts to an apology. You say, I was wrong. That validates that the other person had a reason to be upset. I was wrong. It says, I'm sorry. You never meant to hurt that person's feelings. Even if you don't think you did anything wrong, you never wanted to hurt that person's feelings, I'm going to assume. Okay? So you can say that. I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry that I made you feel that way. Next thing, please forgive me. Because really, we should ask for forgiveness. And the last one, if it's somebody in your family that you could say this to, I love you. Okay, now I taught my children, are you guys listening? Because this is important. I taught my children when it's an accident, you say, I'm sorry. But when it's intentional, I told my children, don't say you're sorry if it's intentional. If it's intentional, you ask for forgiveness. And that is the way I raise my children. Because accidents happen. 
And then you can say, I'm sorry. And then I agree with him. If you hurt somebody's feelings, you would say, I'm sorry, because it was an accident. Would you please forgive me? I never meant to hurt your feelings. But I taught my children, if it wasn't an accident and you did it intentionally, don't bother saying you're sorry. You need to ask forgiveness <laughs> because you blew it. And so that's what I taught my kids. So they knew that there was a defining line because that is owning it, isn't it? If you ask for forgiveness, you are owning it. Now, the reading that you did that went on on how to forgive one another was very important because one of them was corporate forgiveness. Do you remember reading about that? That the, the man that was writing it said that a friend of his was black and at a point the Holy Spirit, um, and he wasn't, and the Holy Spirit moved in his life that he should ask for forgiveness for the things that the white people did to the black people through our history. Did you guys remember reading that part? And that's asking for corporate forgiveness. Um, and it meant a lot to both of them because it was the Holy Spirit's moving and both of them were in tears and the man forgave him. Um, he also talked about sitting next to the woman on the plane that her husband had done horrible things to her. And he said, as a man, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. Even though I didn't do it to you, what your husband did was awful. And please, uh, uh, please forgive us men for what your husband did. And the woman, it really released her. I have had the Holy Spirit do that to me. I have been in a time of prayer and praise and worship and felt very convicted to call a Jewish friend of my daughter's and say, I'm so sorry for what people have done in the name of Christianity to your people through the ages because we'd already had talks and I knew he was very hurt by what Christians had done and therefore he was not open to Messiah because what Christians had done in the name of Jesus to their people through history, through the Inquisition and other things. And so I, I, when I called him and apologized in, in light of, you know, as a Christian, I want to apologize for what our people have done in the name of Messiah to your people. He broke down and cried. It meant the world to him. And I just did what God put on my heart to do. And so when God puts it on your heart to apologize or ask forgiveness for something um, that you represent that group, please do it because you do not know how God's going to use that. Please always walk in obedience when the Holy Spirit puts something on your heart to do. Now, let's look at the forgiveness thing. It says learning to forgive others. And how important is it for us to forgive others? Yeah. Okay, Aaron's saying very quietly, it's important. Guys, do you realize that if you don't forgive somebody, do you know who stays in bondage? Who stays in bondage? You or the person you're not forgiving? You. You're the one that stays in bondage if you don't forgive somebody else. What does the scripture say about forgiving others? Do you have any right to not forgive others? Do you have any right to not forgive others? No. Jesus said that we're forgiven by him, so we have to forgive others. Don't you remember the story that he told about the guy that owed the king money and the king forgave him? Then the guy went out and told the other servant, you owe me money. And, and when the king found out about it, he took that guy and he threw him in prison because he had just forgiven him for a great debt. And then this guy went and treated somebody else badly that owed a small debt. That's us if we're being unforgiving. God forgave us for every sin we ever committed, past, present, and future. Not that we're to go out and sin, okay? But that's a lot, isn't it? We have to forgive other people. Now, does that mean you're going to feel like forgiving them? No. Please be very clear on this. Feelings are fickle. My children have heard me say that more times than I can count. The scripture tells us that our feelings are fickle. What's fickle mean? Um, we... They lie. They lie. Feelings are fickle. They lie. You don't feel your way into actions. You act your way into feelings. Okay? So what you see to be true in the scriptures, you are going to do knowing that it's true, and your feelings will follow. Do what you know to be true. And this particularly applies to you ladies. People go, oh, I felt it, so it was right. That is so bogus. Let it go. Our feelings lie. Go with what you know to be true. How do I know what's true? It's in the scripture. Go with what you know to be true. Don't go by your feelings. So when we forgive somebody, do we have to feel like forgiving them? No. So, does anybody here know what do you do when there's somebody that's really done something heinous to you, but you need to forgive them? What do we do? We ask God to help us forgive them. We ask God to help us to allow the debt to be called even. See, that's what forgiveness is. I love what Lily Tomlin said. Did you guys, you guys don't even know who Lily Tomlin is, I'll bet. Lily Tomlin was a great 
comedian of my time when I was a kid. She was on Laughing, which was in the 60s. She, you probably know her from certain movies, and she's very funny, a very funny lady. And Lily Tomlin said that forgiveness is accepting that you're not going to ever be able to change. You're not going to ever have a hope of a better past. It's done. They, whatever they did was done. You can't change it. You, you're going on now and not counting it against anybody anymore. I've heard forgiveness is just saying that the debt, you no longer owe me the debt. It doesn't mean I feel like I want to come over and hug and kiss you now. It, uh, it doesn't mean I'm going to hang out with you now. It means you no longer owe me for that debt. It's under the blood of Christ. It's free and clear. You don't owe me. I'm not going to be able to change the past. It's done, and it, we're going to go on from here. Does everybody understand that? There are people in my life that I have had a very hard time forgiving, that did things in my childhood that I've been to counselors for, that I had a very, very hard time forgiving. But the Lord is faithful. And if we ask, Lord, I want to do this because it honors you. Help me to forgive this person and ask it over and over again. God will do it. Now, do I want to go hang out with those people? No. Do I want to put myself back in a position for them to crush me or do bad things to me again? No. But have I forgiven them? Yes. That means that I can actually tell those people about the love of Jesus now. I can actually not let that drag me down anymore. I'm free in that, and I can freely serve God, and I can freely love that person. I'm going to tell you this right now. When you pray for somebody that's done something heinous and you want to forgive them, do you know sometimes God will change your perspective on that person, and you'll start feeling sorry for them? And that's what happened to me. I was praying for somebody in authority that I really disliked intensely is a nice way of saying it. And I said, Lord, you told me to pray for this person and forgive this person, so I'm going to pray for them and forgive them. And as I was praying that and honoring God in it, do you know I felt a wash over my whole spirit of pity towards that person. And I'd only felt hatred up till then for that person. And when I asked the Lord to, to, that I would be honest with the Lord and pray for that person like he told me to and ask for forgiveness, I literally, from that point on, felt pity for that person. And if I couldn't hate a person I pitied. And I pitied him because I could see what it was going to be like when he stood before the Lord in judgment, what it was going to be like for that person. And all of a sudden, I had horrible pity for that person because that person wasn't saved and was doing horrible things. And they were, they were looking at damnation and hell. And so all of a sudden, I had a totally different perspective. And it was because I was trying to honor God with my perspective. God will do that to you. He will change your heart. You want to think differently about somebody? Start praying for that person. You start praying for somebody that you can't stand, and God will totally change your perspective on that person because you'll start seeing them the way God sees them. And then it'll shift everything radically. It's totally different. Okay? All right. Um, it mentioned utopia here, and this is really important. Have any of you heard of that before, that there's this idea that uh, some people think that man is born perfect and what messes us up is society? How many of you have ever heard that before? Okay. When you do worldviews, um, one of the starting points, worldviews, they have you read Frankenstein, and they have you read uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, you guys know who Frankenstein is. Well, the original Frankenstein, I, I got to tell you, I did not read the real Frankenstein to my kids because as I started reading it to them, it was so depressing. I got the, uh, who's the little dog that they played out all the history with? Wishbone. I got the wishbone version of Frankenstein and I did that with them because it got the point across and I didn't have to do all that depressing reading. Frankenstein's depressing. Mary Shelley was really twisted. I mean, like, really twisted. If I remember correctly, when her husband died, she went to his grave and, like, held his heart physically. Just a sick person. So I don't see, even as a Christian, the, the reason to read Frankenstein. Just twisted, twisted lady. Oh, as I'm reading it, as I'm reading it, what she is describing as a abusive uh, parent is a good parent, and her idea of a good parent was a neglectful parent. And as I'm reading that to my children, I go, okay, we're going to the library, get the wishbone version, because I am not reading this garbage to you, okay? But the idea was that Frankenstein, her, Mary Shelley was this utopian. She thought everybody's born good, so Frankenstein was created correctly. He would be a good person, but because of what other people did to him, that's why he was a monster. Okay. And then a lot of people think that. You'll hear people say, well, the only reason people are messed up is because what society did to them. Now, what does the Bible tell us? How do we start? Are we starting perfectly? How do we start? Little sinners. Do you have to tell a child now, Johnny, don't share? Do you? No, they got it. It's selfish. It comes naturally, doesn't it? Do you have to tell a child how to lie? Uh-uh. 
They can figure that one out all by themselves, right? No, we're born little sinners. We aren't born, and then society messes us up. We don't have to be taught to be bad. We're born sinners. We have to be saved out of it, don't we? And our parents have to teach us how to act correctly. So that's important. And we have to understand when people think that way that they have a twisted perspective on things. And so when you realize that people are born sinners, then it's a little easier to forgive them. Because um, we're all sinners, aren't we? Okay, let's go over to love and respect because we I want to finish this up. Oh, on page 77, this was important. It said, creating a culture of forgiveness. Have a gracious tongue. So that means to be polite. Use please, thank you, pardon me, I'm sorry. Always be polite. It really does matter. Um, don't be disrespectful, shrill, selfish, or cynical. Um, honor your siblings, especially when they don't deserve it. Did you guys see that one? Honor your siblings, even when they don't deserve it. What does honor mean? It means, I heard James Dobson say this. I thought this was so good. It means when they walk in the room, you go, oh. Because you're giving that person honor, like they're special, like they matter, okay? You don't all physically have to go, oh, when they walk in the room. But it's that idea that that's how you treat people, like they're special. They're made in the image of God, and they're special. Uh, Number four, be quick to apologize to each other. Practice how to give and receive forgiveness. Number five, have a theology of forgiveness throughout your whole life. So that, in other words, you walk in what God has said to do on that. Okay. Um, and we're to, to see the larger picture and to celebrate life. This was very good, this reading. Go over, though, to love and respect, which is on... We already talked about that. It's on page 82. Now, what I noticed here... Okay, guys, be aware of this. In Ephesians 5, I'm pretty sure it's 33. I noticed this without this reading, that when I was really trying to find the Lord and heal our my, my marriage... I noticed as I was in Bible study that the Lord showed me, without learning it from someone else, I always love that, and then when I heard it from someone else, it was confirmation. The Lord showed me that it says, men, love your wives, wives, respect your husbands. Never said, wives, love your husbands. Never said, husbands, respect your wives. Now, it's not that we don't need both things, but I'm going to tell you this right now, and I've sat in, I've sat in whole seminars about this. If you ask every man in an auditorium, would you rather your wife love you or respect you if she only did one? And women, you write down the same. If you wanted your husband to love or respect you, which one would you want if you could only have one? All the women wrote love and all the men wrote respect. We're wired differently. Women want to be loved and adored. We'd like some respect, but we want to be loved and adored. Men would rather be respected than be loved. Wow. Us girls can't get our heads around that at all. Okay? But a man needs to be esteemed. I looked up the word respect because I don't know about you, but I have a hard time with that word. It's like, well, what does that look like? What does that mean? And respect is a sense of worth or excellence of a person, their quality and ability, showing esteem. And what esteem means is to regard them with uh, favorably or with admiration. Your dad wants you to look up to him, and he wants to be your hero. These men in this room want to be respected. They want to be treated like they're going to be a protector and a provider and that they're a hero. Your brothers want to be your hero. Now, I know that's hard for you to believe, ladies, but it's true. And when I first learned about love and respect, I noticed I started to treat my teenage high school male students with more respect. I started to say, yes, sir, and no, sir. You guys have noticed I do that. And my male students, they like that better. You can see them stand a little straighter and do a little better when they're respected. Ladies, treat your brothers, your father, with respect. Treat them with admiration, even when they don't deserve it. Gentlemen, treat the ladies in your life with love. Wow. That means not to have harsh words. That means even when they're being very, very irritating, you're not going to be harsh back because they need you to... Uh, try to love them. It's, it's hard and it's different. When we do those things, overall relationships do better. In marriage, it's huge. Because when your mom starts striking out at your dad, usually she feels unloved. 
She doesn't even realize she feels unloved, but if you do this study, you start realizing that, and literally, after you do this study, like I've started to say to my husband, when you do so-and-so, I feel unloved. And he looks at me and he goes, why would that make you feel unloved? I go... I'm just telling you, when you do this, it makes me feel unloved. And since we've done this study, he'll say to me afterwards, he'll say, when you do so-and-so, I don't feel respected. I feel disrespected. And then I understand why he strikes out. Because if I make him feel disrespected, he gets mad and he gets mean, okay? Well, it's not him. It's how we're wired. And when I feel unloved, I get nasty, And I'm I'm telling you, we've learned this since, and we'll stop and say, you make me feel unloved or you make me feel disrespected. Guys, learn to do that with your brothers and your sisters. Learn to say, you know, Luke, when you do so-and-so to me, I feel unloved. And and I want to show you respect, but I'm telling you, I feel very unloved when you do this. And I know you love me. You're my brother. I know you love me. Or, you know, he should be able to come to you and go, you know, when you go into my stuff without my my permission, I feel very disrespected. And, and, and then you should go, wow, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel disrespected. Let me, let me correct that. I'll ask you permission next time. Right? Okay? Guys, that's the, the bottom line is to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Correct? That's that golden rule that Jesus put out for us. Okay, so uh, hopefully this radically shifted your life. All right, you guys, have a Jesus-filled week. And for you, I hope to see you in some other classes and apply this stuff to God's honor and glory. Bye-bye.